So brilliant everyone, welcome to the call. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited about this um, call. I have been sort of a, a biochar um, enthusiast for um, yeah a good, a good number of years now. And one of the great inspirations that I got about about biochar and biofertilizers originally was um, by doing this course in 2018 with with Matt, which Matt organized. And uh, it was it was Matt basically platforming Jairo Restrepo, who is this phenomenal uh, Colombian farmer um, who has, I, as I as I sort of uh, interpreted, has been responsible for influencing a huge number of farmers around the world uh, um, and how to sort of ferment their own fertilizers um, and, 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 and thereby withstand the, you know, the, the commercial pressures for the green revolution and all of its chemicals. And I've got his book here, which I got on the course, the, uh, the ABC of sort of phos phosphites, organic agriculture, phosphites and stone meal, which has been brilliant. And this is a great picture of, of, of one of the first workshops we did, which was just making, a, 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 a I guess what, um, would be called a sort of complete compost heap. I found this so empowering. Um, I, I really, one of my take homes was just like the right materials to to do this, to make this it compost inoculum that you can then brew all of these fertilizers with is just by combining the materials that are all around you. Um, and then this was a total um, kind of mind brain shifter for me. I My background was brewing kombucha and um, that was really my only uh, experience in anaerobic fermentation and then here was this um amazing teacher um telling us that we could brew various minerals to make fertilizers to feed and matt was explaining how you know they'd been spraying it on their orchards and we even made um uh biochar from bones um and mm -hmm. and, and learn about phosphates and how we could you know that that, that that was a huge thing because phosphates are so expensive and we're literally sacrificing the earth to get them and hoard them for our farming and here we are being able to uh, burn it into bioavailable forms you know uh, and so this was total game changer and chromatography we had an introduction to chromatography you can see from the pictures it was incredibly rich um yeah sort of uh several days it was five days of um of really deep learning and staying on Matt's farm. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just share a few of these pictures. Um, my the other take home that I got, which is ch which sort of changed my life and uh, the way I saw uh, started to conceive microbes and work with them was this this quote um, which I wrote down: "The function of microbiology is to allow for the union between minerals and organic matter." Um, I thought that was incredibly powerful. So yeah, I'd like to thank Matt for running that course. And I know now he's started to um, do his own, well, well, he's been doing it all along, but really sort of focusing on his own teaching. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'd like to pass to you, Matt, if you would um, give us a little update on, on, on everything you're up to. Great. Here Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, thank you very much. It's really nice to see those photos. Uh, I think you've done me a real um, service by just taking people into what I'm trying to talk about through that course. I shall just jump in. So um, very briefly, I'm Matt Dunwell. Um, I have been, all right, was farming at Ragman's Lane Farm for about 34 years. I've recently passed the farm onto the Ecological Land Co-op. So I'm sort of, I'm re-emerging as a, I've got, I'm going through my sort of uh, chrysalis imaginal cell sort of coming out into the butterfly type thing. Having taught through the, through the, through the farm, I'm now sort of um, hitting the road. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hawking myself around as a, as a teacher with wheels. So this was the, the, the farm. My work at the farm is primarily growing organic uh, apples. And but we were also teaching, so this photograph takes in both of those things. The the farm uh, we started the farm in 1990. Uh, it's about 60 acres. The three main businesses, um, I guess, orchards, mushrooms, and and teaching. That was the main. That was probably going back about five, ten years ago. So the orchards were producing table fruit and apple juice. The mushrooms were fruiting logs and spawn bags. 
and um, and we were teaching as well. We had about eight to ten people working on the farm, and I'm I'm really hoping that the ecological land co-op will provide um, that they're, they're going to partner with the Land Workers Alliance and provide a sort of a teaching and access to land um, th that will hopefully take forward Ragmans into the next era, as it were. Um, it's also going to carry on hosting the same tenants, which is really important to me. So you've got Steve pick up doing his willow and, and Kim on the vegetable garden. We were teaching courses, permaculture, regen ag courses, chromatography, natural beekeeping. And I'm also really hoping that uh, that teaching aspect will carry on through the Land Workers Alliance. Anyway, that's a very, very brief introduction to Ragmans. I'm going to do a really um, slight, sh sharp left turn now. And um, so I've recently organized, co-organized a conference in Kiev um, on biochar, which was really, really fascinating. And we managed to get 12 different presentations, mostly from university lecturers, professors who are, who are working with biochar. Um, and one of them was, was looking at um, the use of biochar in munitions damaged soils. Uh, so it was quite relevant to to, to the Ukrainian situation. Um, so some of these slides I've got, I've got Ukrainian subtitles, which I apologize for. Just to explain this slide, um, I, I'm in the summer I make uh, charcoal using um, an oil drum. Um, you'll be familiar with this technique. Um, and I inoculate the charcoal, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. And the, the, the slide on the right is just really uh, some pepper plants that are looking particularly healthy in, in my um, biochar potting compost. Um, this caused a, a bit of interest on the WhatsApp thread. Um, this is in the winter I make uh, charcoal in, in my wood burner in the house. So uh, this is a little clear view, it's a vision, uh, vision clear view, I think. Um, and it's a catering, it's a stainless steel catering tin, uh, which we I pack with, with wood. And then you can just see it burning away in the middle slide there. And it creates a lot of heat so we can cook on it and boil water on it and stuff. But obviously the heat is not lost in the, in the charring process. It's captured into the house. Uh, the gas is vent out the chimney. And it burns really cleanly. Actually, the fire is cleaner at the end of a biochar burn than, than before. And I get about a kilo of charcoal out of this tin every day. And so I did just on the back of an envelope, I did some calculations. It, uh, the, the people talk about adding five tons per hectare of biochar to agricultural soils. So if you scale that right down to a garden, that's half a kilo per square meter. And so if you're making a kilo a day, you're, you, you can inoculate two, two square meters a day. <laughs> and if you're burning your wood for, for the winter, say 150 days, you can, um, you can make enough biochar for 300 square meters, which is, you know, two allotments, or it's a decent vegetable garden size. Um, so even with a little tin like this, um, often the best solutions are the smallest solutions. It's very, very easy to do. And um, for me, this is I've done, I've you know, I've done a big retort kilns that fit in the back of transits. So I've done uh, biochar stoves for India and I ended up with this little tin in, in a, it's the cheapest retort kiln, I think, on the market. Um, in terms of inoculating charcoal, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Vermicomposting. I, I grind it up. I put it through a chipper. Actually, I have set specific blades I put on my chipper which get completely knackered and I put my charcoal through the chipper and then I sw switch the blades around. They've got a, a sharp side for wood and a blunt side for charcoal and it tins, it takes the charcoal down. This is a wood master mulcher. It takes the charcoal down to sort of between eight and two millimeter size, which is um, really nice for, for inoculating biochar. Uh, you can pee on it obviously, and you can feed it to, to livestock. Um, and there's been there's some really interesting work coming along now with working with cattle um, and um, the, 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 the health of the cattle improves. There's lots of minerals in the biochar. And of course, having been through the rumen of the cattle, it, the biochar is inoculated perfectly. So it's a really, really nice way of, of inoculating broad scale grassland with biochar. 
Um, you will have seen these photographs, so I'm not going to spend too long on them. But I, so biochar, properties of biochar, they retain water. They are a, a house for microbes. And the, the cation exchange, they actually increase cation exchange by holding on to individual minerals. And um, I like this, this uh, photo of the internal structure of biochar. because And, and uh, I put it alongside this photo, which is um, to help us think about um, how we think about soils, I think. Cathedrals are beautiful because of the spaces. And <clears throat> our soils, if they're functional, should be 50%. Uh, by volume, they should be 50% either air or water. And so I think that that we should be thinking about our soils in terms of cathedrals and the space that we can create in our soils. Charcoal is brilliant for this. Um, and I think people often talk about charcoal or biochar in terms of climate change by thinking about the carbon that they're putting back into the soil. And I'd like to say that that is important. But for me, there's a really important climate change story that's really not talked about enough, which is the, the evapotranspiration cycle, the, the water cycle in soils. If we can get our soils to act like sponges and absorb water and then transpire water and get that functionality back into our soils, that cooling effect of evapotranspiration is really significant in terms of climate change and in terms of short term climate change cooling of the planet. So I think that the biochar story has got a, 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 another dimension in terms of the, the water cycle. So here we are in a big cathedral and we've got a whole empty set of chairs. So we need a, a congregation for it. Um, and I was sort of trying to try and make this analogy. But actually, if you've looked at soil microbes under a microscope, they're really not praying. They're doing everything else but praying. They are, they're eating each other, they're reproducing, they're pretty elemental in what they're doing. So I think probably it's it's better to think of biochar in the soil in terms of a, a nightclub. And I think that's what we should be thinking about. Um, and so in order to make your biochar really work, you've got to inoculate it with various different things. So here, here is um, some biochar that I've made, and I try and put minerals into it in the forms of um, blood and bone, uh, rock dust. Uh, there's some molasses that goes in to help the microbes. Um, it's an energy source for the microbes. I put a bit of sea salt in. So if I'm making a solution of, say, 10 litres, I might put a couple of teaspoons of sea salt in. And salt is great in terms of a really wide spectrum of minerals. And also they're in the perfect ratio for soil microbes. You know, we've all come from the sea. So we are able to absorb the, the minerals from sea salt really, and it's really beneficial. So that's the mineral story. Um, and then also... Uh, you want to create the biology to grow through the biochar. So that can be added in the form of manure or vermicompost. I quite like using duff, the, the, the woodland compost. A couple of handfuls of your own compost is great. So that's the biology and the minerals. And then, and then there's something really interesting. If Depending on how you make your biochar, it can be either acidic or alkaline. So if there's a lot of um, ashing in the bio char it's going to take it into an alkaline state and it can be quite quite caustic or biochar can be fairly acidic so you can steer your your ph of your biochar according to how you inoculate it so if you're if you use wood ash in your inoculant you can you can steer it towards a higher ph and if you use lactobacillus you can take it down to a more acidic state and and you can bring it you can steer it back into neutral, which is um, it's just, just elegant way of using fermentation, really. Um, and once it's neutral, you uh, you just get this explosion of growth. So this is just full of high fee, uh, and and it, basically it's creating the first and second trophic level of the soil food web, so that when you put it into your soil, it's going to kickstart your soil. It's going to give rather than rather than take. And if you put raw charcoal into the soil, um, then that's when it starts to absorb 
your your minerals and demineralize the soil at least for two or three years so so you can get around that by by inoculating it well um anyway that's not what i've come to talk about <laughs> i've come to talk about biofertilizers um i'll be quick tom so this is Jairo Restrepo. you talked about him so that's great uh well known in south america just uh, just a bit of context you may know that cuba went organic when um it was cut off from the soviet empire um soviet union and and actually hiro trained fourteen thousand extension workers in cuba so that was the impact he had on on uh, that that journey for cuba to go organic and now when you go across south america you'll find cuban extension workers working in all sorts of different countries using a lot of this technology so he took so traditional japanese microbiology um and he translated it into a South American context. Um, and, and his approach is understand your soil through soil analysis, sap analysis, observation. He brings a very scientific approach to the work. Um, understand the interaction of minerals and plants. And then you introduce you, your nutrition, which is mainly minerals, um, through your biological ferments. And focus on system health, total system health, rather than yield. So those are some of the sort of take homes that I've I've learned from from Jairo. Uh, we had another guy, Juan Fran Lopez, who was lived on the farm for seven years, and he's really taken this work and developed it. He's based in Spain, and he's also produced a fantastic little ebook called the Biofertilizer Manual. Um, Jairo's book has been plugged by Tom, um, and the Biofertilizer Manual. The, I put the website in blue. Just go onto his website. It's I think it's 20 euros and it's got about 15 to 20 different recipes in there. I'd really recommend it. Um, on the right, you can see us making native micro solid, which is um it's like the mother of of, of biofertilizers. Um, and it's it's one part duff, which is the woodland compost, to two parts of bran, either rice or cereal bran, and you mix them up. And you put in some molasses and then you you put it into an airtight barrel for two months and the the biology that's in the woodland duff reproduces and and becomes dormant and so you can use like a couple of handfuls of this this native microbe solid in a lot of the the ferments that i'm going to be just quickly talking about um one of one of the the main biofertilizer ferments is very simple I've just put it on this little barrel here in a 30 liter barrel, three kilos of microbes, the solid nature of solid, solid native microbe mix, a liter of molasses, three quarters of a liter of milk, rock dust, and the rest is water, good water. So rainwater. The microbes provide the biology. The molasses provides the energy. The rock dust uh, provides the minerals and the milk is interesting it steers it towards a lactic fermentation which is a beneficial fermentation and it'll keep it from going putrid or going down the wrong fermentation pathway um uh, there's a slight misconception around biofertilizers i think there's often a confusion between what elaine ingham's talking about and what Jairo restrepo is talking about so elaine ingham is saying you can take biology and bubble it through and provide a, a, a wet aerated sugar solution and then the biology explodes and, and you need and it's great i'm not knocking it at all i think all of these things can be used in different ways um it doesn't it you can't store it very easily and it needs quite a lot of sort of equipment to make it whereas i think the biofertilizers they are anaerobic and so if i just go on a, a thing so what's happening in that blue barrel is the bacteria are reproducing, the yeasts and the fungi are, are reproducing. And as they as they reach adverse conditions, the, the cell bodies of, of, of the microbiology rupture and they sporulate. So the, the fungi will sporulate, the bacteria will cyst, insist, which is which is them leaving a tiny, tiny little dormant ability to reproduce in the future. But, but what happens is that the cell body, which is full of enzymes, carbohydrates, minerals, vitamins, proteins, organic acids, spills out into the biofertilizer and creates a sort of soup that 
plants can easily absorb. So biofertilizers are around producing the soup, which is the sort of the, the food source. And Elaine Ingham's uh, composting, aerated compost tea is around producing the biology. Um, the nice thing about the, the biofertilizers is the biology is still in there. So, so if you've got a particular uh, fungi or yeast or bacteria that's going to live well on the underside of a leaf, it's going to arrive in a sporulated state and reproduce. So it, it comes back to life. So that's just a very, very brief um, sort of cra crashing through biofertilizers. Um, on the farm, we were making it at scale. We, we did soil tests. We were short on molybdenum and zinc, I think. So you were able to fortify biofertilizers with zinc sulfate or molybdenum sulfate. Tiny amounts, say 20 grams in a barrel this size. And, and that will help your mineral rebalance. So you can, and, and when I was talking to larger scale farmers, this is what really piqued their interest was that you can use quite a, a sophisticated way of, of rebalancing minerals on your farm. Yes, this is what, this is one friend making a, a fungicide, but that's a different story. So, and, and we were using it at scale at Ragnall's. Um, or this is, a th we had about a thousand fruit trees and um, this is, I think 400 liters of um, biofertilizer going on through the through a horticultural spray on the back of a tractor. So it's the sort of technology you can use with a hand mister in a in a greenhouse, or you can spray it from airplanes, which is you know done as well in South America. Very briefly, Tom, I wanted to talk a bit about Lactobacillus, um, and you may already know about Lactobacillus, but for me, in terms of where where we're at. For, for community composting, you know, you will all have experience of dealing with smelly, shitty stuff in a barrel if you're doing community composting. <laughs> and, and, and how you deal with that is, is pretty important. So I would really recommend that you have a go with lactobacillus because it's dead easy to make. You put rice in a glass, you can give it a shake and then use the rice to cook with so you don't even lose any rice. Um, you you then take the take that rice water after about three days and you add up to 10 times the amount of milk and the trick is put it in a warm place or put it in a hot box with a with a liter of boiling water next to it and that will just give the heat overnight for it to turn and it creates this uh, curds and whey archetypal curds and whey so the whey is at the top you can eat that cut it with some garlic and coriander and salt and olive oil no wastage there it's really nice and the serum underneath is the lactobacillus now you can use that uh i use it as a foliar spray you can dilute it one to 100 uh, less than that one to a thousand you can dilute it to you can as i was talking about you can inoculate your biochar to drop the ph there's some really interesting stuff going on with using lactobacillus and biochar together in in dairy units to treat the slurry what lactobacillus does is it it creates an acidic environment which scavenges sugar uh, and so the the things uh that's that smell in in compost and slurry are a sort of putrids the enzymes that are creating putrid smells those are out competed by lactobacillus the other thing that happens in slurry is is ammonia it gasses off ammonia and you can lose up to 50% of your nitrogen through that gassing off. So lactobacillus will also, uh, uh, it knocks out urease, which is the enzyme that produces ammonia. So uh, by combining lactobacillus and biochar in dairy units, you can deal with um, nitrates going into groundwater. You make the slurry twice as effective and it doesn't smell. And also the other thing that's really interesting that we're finding is that uh, you create, you introduce the lactobacillus through a spray in the dairy units and the vet's bills drop. All the other infections clear up. Um, it's an amazing um, antibacterial sort of, because it's scavenging all the things that, that the pathogens are, are wanting to, to, to reproduce with. Uh, so I think lactobacillus is really, really interesting. There's a little thing that I want to show you. So I've, I've been um, putting my compost from the way from the kitchen in a blue barrel 
So the blue barrel's got a litre of lactobacillus, a litre of molasses, and about 20 litres, 30 litres of rainwater. Okay, that's it. And I don't even put, it's not even a hermetically sealed barrel. It's just got a lid that sits loosely on it. And I tip my kitchen waste into it. Um, so that's vegetables, cooked food, rice, fish, bones, meat. I put the odd bit of roadkill in. Um, and uh, so it all goes in the blue barrel and it doesn't really smell. Uh, it might whiff a little tiny bit, but really not like putrid smell. Uh, and you can see when I give it a prod with the with the spade, the color of it, and I've siphoned it out just to show you, that's what comes out the bottom. So you put a you know a watering can full of, of water in the barrel and you take a watering can full of that stuff out. And it's brilliant. It's really, really good um, liquid fertilizer. But you don't have any rats. You don't have any smell. Um, so it's a good one. And that's that's a complete crash through, <laughs> through everything. And I've ended up with this little module of a, a, a bean plant with the, with the mycorrhiza and the fungi interacting with the root of the plant, which for me is like poetry in motion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matt. That was absolutely stunning. I've never seen such like the first thing blew my mind, like the biochar, my, the amount of myce mycelium running you had through that biochar, and and then and then thank you for like that really clear distillation of like yeah the difference that, between the confusion between Elaine and the Hyro sort of you know approach the anaerobic aerobic like th that was really really helpful and um, just yeah really incredible what we're doing with lactobacillus um yeah thank you matt that was awesome introduction to some of the stuff you are teaching and I'm, i just you know i'd love to put it out there I'd, I'd love to do more work with community composting with local authorities if anybody knows that uh, of opportunities to come in and just uh work alongside people um i'm up for it and i've got i've got some time now to get on the road and, and do some teaching so yeah that would be great and thanks for the platform tool Thank you, Matt. Brilliant stuff. Okay, quick introduction to Matt. You, Matt is a consultant researcher for the Farming with Fungi project. Uh, he has a PhD in microbiology, DNA sequencing, um, and synthetic biology, uh, working in Bristol and Swansea uh, areas. Uh, and he's one of our longest standing mycelium members. So thank you, Matt. Big up. And um, yeah, over to you. Nice time. Thanks, Tom. Big up yourself and Matt as well. I've learned a lot from both of you. Uh, and I'm bringing what I've learned in with uh, my training in research. So if you go on to the next slide, um, yeah. I can talk about some other people that I've learned from a lot as well. They're over at Koitaliland in West Wales. And that's a fascinating project in itself, but together with them, uh, we applied for some funding, which the details are on the next slide, uh, a couple of years ago, and it's with the Carbon Innovation Fund, which is from the Co-op Foundation, and they funded us and a bunch of other groups. And our projects have many different aspects, but the bits that I've been involved with have all been, it's called the Farming with Fungi Project. And it's it's been about testing different kinds of fertilizers, uh, microbial uh, biological fertilizers in, in the field. Uh, so we're renting a plot of land from the Botanic Gardens of Wales. Uh, in the bottom right, you can see they have the largest single span greenhouse in the world. It's really huge. That's that shiny thing, shiny bubble. And then at the top of Circle there is where we're setting up this field trial. Uh, you can see the area that we've cleared. Yeah, getting it from just a, I don't know what it had been used for before. It was, it was kind of pasture into a one acre market garden with, there's going to be four 
Uh, Polytunnels there in the end, it's been quite an undertaking and I haven't done much of the, the hard work myself, but I've seen it through the process. So if anyone's interested in that, we can talk about that more. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, I'll start talking about, oh, um, oh, okay. So yeah, this is how it looks on the ground. Um, and the idea is that we are combining a market garden uh, we're going to sell some of the food to the, they have a really nice cafe there at the Botanic Gardens and combine that with uh, a trial of some of these different in, inoculants. Um, there are, yeah, they'll be growing a lot of crops there, but this year uh, we've set up a trial just with maize, which means, I think it means like, bringer of life or something of that in the uh the taino cultures of of the caribbean islands and um yeah i i, I want to acknowledge all all this that we're learning um yeah really comes from deep down and from people that have done this for a long long time yeah it's is bio the biofertilizers that I've learned about on the courses at Ragman's Farm that Matt mentioned, and the biofertilizer manual would be the the first stop for learning more about um, how to make some of these. So we're testing the native micro biofertilizer, and we're doing that with and without some fungal inoculants as well. Uh, and we're also going to compare that to when we've planted maize without any any inoculation whatsoever. Uh, I think this year we didn't include any charcoal in the inoculum, uh, but in future years the idea is that we would because it would provide a home for uh, the microbes and for the fungi as well because normally um when you're making the the fungus that i'll talk about uh you do use vermiculite and so james scrivens who i have been working with to set up this field trial uh he he reckons that if we're using biochar it'd be a, a good alternative so you can stain arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi quite easily yeah this is what it looks like it grows in the plant roots and you can cultivate it using grasses uh there are some really inexpensive ways from the rodale institute they've they've given details of how you can make this um so this is the field trial itself um if you play the video um that planted 800 uh, corn plants, maize plants. I think, yeah, when you're working at that scale, uh, I'm sure a few of you will know <laughs> having tools to do it <laughs> makes your life easier. But we've done a randomized block trial. Um, so we've got three replicates and in each bed, uh, we've just randomized the order in which we've done either the fungus, the microbes, the negative control without anything, or the fungus and the microbes together. Uh, and on the right is just an image of that, uh, that layout that we planned, but it's the second year of a five-year project. So we'll be trying this over and over again. I think that's it now. Uh, oh, and just a, a little mention of um, this paper that I published this week. I I did a PhD in synthetic biology, and I thought a lot about uh, the accessibility of these uh, tools that are being developed. It's kind of, yeah, it is very tangential, but um, I thought I would mention it it's all about this uh idea of conviviality of uh how we can have tools that empower us basically um 
so I I thought uh, since I've written all about it may as well mention it uh, so I'm still doing some research now looking at uh, microplastic degradation but that's a bit of a different story that's at Swansea Uni um, but yeah today I just wanted to tell you about the farming with fungi project and uh, be here if there are any questions from anyone using similar techniques, maybe I can learn from you as well. Uh, and then the next slide, the final one. Uh, I'd like to thank the Co-op Foundation. I'd like to uh, thank, yeah, Ragmans um, and, and Juan Fram with the biofertilizer training. And uh, there's Trill Farm. We did a market gardening course down in Devon, and uh, I, I learned a lot there. I really recommend that for anyone who's interested in setting up. It really demystified it, shows you how you can um, do it on a budget. And uh, lastly, I just want to say... Okay, what's happening? Stop sharing. Okay. I think that's better. Sorry about that, everyone. I, someone was talking and I tried to uh, mute them and then I accidentally muted Matt. Um, but yeah, back to Coram now. Um, Matt, you were just wrapping up, but then I think we had a question. Oh, yeah, 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 just thanks, thanks to everyone. And uh, uh, just a, um, kind of a heads up that next year, my plan is to go self-employed and do uh, testing and brewing and so if there are any opportunities for teaching um, or, or testing environment, DNA sequencing, uh, those kind of things, research, then I'm I'm looking for opportunities. Yeah. Thank you so much, Matt. That was really awesome. So cool. And congratulations on that project and making all those connections and, and, and doing this like vital work. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, I'm sure sure some good connections will come from that uh, putting that out there now so thank you um adam did you have a direct like response you wanted to make to matt there no i was just going to say you came off on just was going to finish up and say you know and then we didn't hear the rest but um okay well so you're i was giving him the three words that he was that he left on okay <laughs> but yeah sure. thank you so much for matt, and matt that was really cool was super really cool, cool. Really brilliant presentations guys thank you so much so yeah over to you adam um to tell us um yeah give us an update from the world of the soil ecology lab and uh, the new project the what's it called the farming with the the, the 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 specific like maze one so just in case that anyone doesn't know adam is the bioengineer for the soil ecology lab um they are really pioneering organization working on concentrating soil food web biology um, with the method that they innovated. Uh, it's the UK's uh, first soil food web product and they're working on scaling it to agriculture. They're working with lots of farmers now, um, which is really exciting. And uh, yeah, I've, I've kind of invited Adam to join to, 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 to th th this call. Um, so it could be part um, of a, the same, you know, um, kind of mandala with biofertilizers and and to get an insight into how Adam is, is and, and and Daniel are, and everyone at Soil Ecology Labs are manufacturing the goop for widespread soil ecosystem restoration to help farmers. So over to you, mate. You cool, yeah. Up? So just I'll just yeah do the intro as well. Um just like Tom said, yeah, we are um building off the work of Dr. Laningham. We're trying to uh, condense that kind of information into a product that you can simply buy and use uh, and we've done that um, so we've created a product it, it arrives to a farmer it looks kind of like a non-newtonian fluid like a ketchup or a nutella and it contains all those soil food web it's kind of like a um, what do you call them like a biocontrol you know like a live product literally a live product it has active micro microbiology um, we, we assess it with microscopy every time we make it. Um, so we assess bacteria, fungi, protozoa, uh, nematodes. Um, and really what we give out is is um, the fungi and nematode statistics with it. We we did a quite a detailed look into the country's compost 
And we found that a lot of the time that's kind of what they're lacking. Um, often they're lacking a bit of fungi, um, which takes time, basically. You know, that's the secret ingredient for fungi. You need to set the pile up nicely and then give it time and they will appear. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to condense all this information into a product. We figured that Elaine's whole spiel is really good, but not everyone is going to adopt it because like Matt Dunwell said, it's kind of hard to adopt especially the whole compost tea thing, you need infrastructure, right? So we don't work with compost teas. We just work simply with compost extracts. We say we use compost as a bio incubator to grow these microbes. Then we extract them um, and we concentrate them into this goopy substance that's become known as goop. Or if we're in the professional big ag world, we call it NutriBridge. But everyone's going to call it goop forever, right? Because that's what it looks like. It's goopy. We get lots of questions like, are the microbes happy in that goop? Yeah, they are happy, but it is a live product. It's, you know, extracted from a terrestrial ecosystem and it's designed to be returned to a terrestrial ecosystem as fast as possible. They are aerobic microbes. So they can last quite a long time in the tub, but we advise people to use it as soon as it lands. That's the idea. You get it, you use it. Um, lots of the microbes are very durable in that environment, though you'd be very surprised um, how aerobic fungi can survive in very reduced conditions. So, yeah. So um, we've created this product and we're testing it ourselves. Lots of farmers are testing it. We're now working with some large names that are, you know, big companies that are pushing forward with Regen Ag. So that's really cool. So going into our own testing a little bit, um, our main focus is wheat, barley and grass, because if you can sort that out, you can do a lot of damage in this world, you know, in the UK, especially. We do a lot of grass growing here. So if you can figure out how to grow grass with compost in a kind of circular economic fashion using the green waste sites as the kind of um, organic matter fodder to grow these um, microbes on, then you can do a lot of good. You can cover a lot of ground. Um, so the idea is to utilize those green waste sites for the creation of an optimized compost product that can be delivered to the farmer and they can simply bang it in a sprayer into a, um, you know, like a ripper dripper, they can apply it to seeds and they can get all the benefits without having to do the work. We also consult all the early adopters that do want to do the work, you know, the people that do want to find out how to make good compost and what techniques align with success, whether that's using Johnson's two bioreactors or Elaine's Dunphilic compost, the kind of the, the Berkeley technique and the Berkeley method or, you know, worm, worm castings or anything like that. So I'm going to get into um, what we found. So we've done some controlled trials with wheat in controlled environments. I'll share a few with them with you guys now, the results of those. Cool. So what we did is we got two beds. We got a control bed and a treatment bed. Um, we got our product and we applied it to it. We applied it as a seed treatment and then we did five subsequent applications to the soil. Uh, and then we worked with a company called Biomakers. They do a genomic analysis that's... Um, kind of fitted for agriculture and horticulture. Not only does it give you lists of microbes and different analytical tools to compare controls and treatments, it also gives you functionality, a certain amount of functionality. So we were looking into what can we expect if you know people buy the product or if people are making their own compost extracts and they're utilizing them at scale with agricultural soils. So we got some agricultural soil, we bought it indoors, we put it into beds, um, and we planted wheat in it, giving them a seed treatment. Then we did five subsequent applications of goop at about 1.5 mil, 1.5 milliliters of this slurry phase compost extract per square meter, right? Which is about 15 liters per hectare. So people, farmers are using about 14, 15 liters per hectare. On the website, I think it says 14. So doesn't sound like a lot, does it? 1.5 mil per square meter. Doesn't sound like a lot at all. But after six treatments we tested, or one seed treatment of five treatments to the soil, we tested again. And these were the statistically significant changes in the biome. What we saw were more, more genetic potential. So this test measures genetic potential. So they're looking at genomic data, which is all their own IP. So, um, I don't, you know, can't share exactly what's going on, but they're looking at genetic material and they're looking for genes turning on or increasing in abundance. So what we saw 
is a statistically significant increase in salicylic acid production. That's exogenous salicylic acid production, not in the plant, but in the rhizosphere. So the potential for the production of salicylic acid. And what that does is kind of, um, it buffers biotic and abiotic stresses. So in times of drought, with various different environmental factors like saline conditions, um, it acts as a, a phenolic plant hormone in the plant, and it has various jobs that are linked with plant growth. So it's a, it's a, a liquid carbon resource, basically, that the plant creates. And the, if the microbes are creating it in the rhizosphere, the plant can save energy in the creation of that um, organic carbon molecule. And by taking it up, they get benefit from it. So they're, they're buffered, you know, they're not using energy. It's coming from the soil and it's a stress relieving um, compound. It relieves stress from, yeah, biotic and abiotic stresses. So what's that mean? You know, environmental conditions, drought, but also pathogens, the attack of pathogens. Okay, so what else did we see? We saw the production of more exopolysaccharides or the genes related to the production of exopolysaccharides. So more potential for exopolysaccharide production. And that means the soil is getting stickier. Again, it's getting more drought resilient. Um, it's holding moisture and in saline, heavy metal conditions, you know, high heavy metal conditions, um, the plant is buffered. It's filling gaps um, in between the geological soil, the mineral soil, and it's causing aggregation. So against the control, the goops encouraging plants to um, to make aggregates and to and to buffer drought resistance, both from the silic salicylic acid and the exopolysaccharide production. And then we've got heavy metal resistance. So again, it, it's it's very similar story. Um, these must be genes that are linked with. Um, the buffering of heavy metals. So almost creating membranes around the um, the rhizosphere, the roots, and shielding the roots from the external environment. And then insecticidal agents. And then if we go down, we can see another effect. I think it's nematicidal agents here. So genes associated with microbes that are hunting insects and um, shielding their host plants from phytophagous nematodes, so plant pathogenic nematodes. Here we go. So an increase in genes associated with microbes that shield the rhizosphere from plant pathogenic nematodes. A big problem in agricultural soils, particularly conventional agricultural soils, where the whole soil food were, has been damaged, you know, where plants aren't encouraged to root very much, um, where they're pushed with nitrogen and maybe not supported with balanced mineral nutrition. And therefore, they kind of become a breeding ground for uh, these kind of pathogens. So in six applications of the goop or, you know, compost extract you can make, based on Elaine Ingham's kind of targets with direct microscopy. So we're looking for minimum targets of just the general groups, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. And then in our product, we're trying to deliver a few times more than the minimums that Elaine says, because we're trying to concentrate it. So it's got three, five, ten times the amount of microbes uh, up to 20 or 40 times for some of the microbes um, than are suggested from the sort of food web school and from Elaine. Cool. So that's what you can expect to happen in a short period of time. Um, I'm going to go on to just show you a quick list. Well, in typically in this product, we've got like 800, something like that. We're in the hundreds of different types of bacteria that we can identify and less types of fungi but still hundreds and we haven't done any genomic work on the higher trophic levels yet but lots and lots of different microbes and it seems like you can train these piles on what you feed into them so you feed in a chitin source you get more chitin decomposing fungi you feed in you know a keratin source you get keratin decomposing fungi it's kind of that simple and some, some of those adam on chitinous and keratinous um composting inputs just just in case not everyone um has that sort of you know uh, yeah you know. okay so any kind of bristle exoskeleton on a on an insect is going to be chitin based and and the what the building kind of blocks of fungi themselves are chitin and then keratin any any hair and bristle 
um, on an animal skin cells, um, stomach so linings. There's a lot of keratin in manure, um, yeah. hoof and horn. You know, these kind of things are, are full of keratin. Thank and you. so as you feed chitin, something like that, into a compost pile, you support chitinolytic fungi and different chitin decomposers. Those chitinolytic fungi happen to be fungi like trichoderma, who are really good at shielding rhizospheres from some of these pathogens. You know, they're really good with the arable crops, with uh, cannabis, with tomatoes, with things like that. And we actually did a, a study into um, the rhizosphere of wild wheat in Israel, and we found a lot of these, you know, early successional fungi, penicillium, aspergillus, trichoderma, curdlaria, alternaria, these things. Not necessarily, um, alternaria is often thought of as a pathogen, but not always operating like that. So hundreds and hundreds of bacteria and hundreds and hundreds of fungi um, in this consortia. And you can kind of manipulate that. We've even seen plastic decomposing fungi in a pile that was used to heat a shower, right? So it had 125 meters of plastic tube wrapped up in it, and it had a plastic decomposing microbe in it. So that was that was interesting. Wow. So because you guys are so into biochar, I thought I'd touch on this as well. If you allow your compost to mature um, sufficiently, what I mean by that is get old enough where it starts smelling like a, a lovely forest soil. Often at this point, white rock fungi will kind of start getting more small, diminutive. Their, their growth won't be so, so, um, so kind of strong in those piles so they won't grow so fast they won't be so virulent that's the word i'm looking for they'll kind of die back a little bit they'll be like stringy uh, the worms won't be so big they'll get smaller they'll generally be a bit more purple that's because your fungal biomass is increasing and your bacterial biomass is decreasing and as your bacterial biomass decreases we often see a drop in the size of the worm it's still the same worm you know it's still a composting worm a tiger worm um, but because the bacterial biomass is dropping, um, the size, the chunkiness of the worms drop, the worm biomass decreases. So once you get to that point, it smells like forest soil. You want it to look relatively screened, even though you haven't screened it, meaning all the parent material that went in is, is pretty much broken down. A lot of the wood chip has disappeared. You can't really tell um, the parent material you put in there. Um, Johnson Sioux bioreactors are really good for this once they get to 12, 13, 14 months and above. Um, the compost extract you'll extract, so that's that's what the goop is. It's compost extract. We extract it into water, then we take all the water out of it until it looks like ketchup. So in that, it's basically like the processed, the fully processed organic matter that's being passed through a 400 micron mesh. So that's pretty much like what we used to call humus, mineral associated organic matter. Um, and it's got some very um, attractive mineral ratios in it. So here's an NRM report of the goop, and you've got 4,000 ppm or milligrams per kilogram of calcium, and you've got 400 magnesium. That's a 10 to 1 calcium to magnesium ratio, much like William Ulbricht found when he looked at humus and, and the organic matter fraction of the soil. Generally, it levels out about 10 to 1, and that's what he called ideal. So we've got an ideal calcium to magnesium ratio. So perfect for charging your biochar. We've also got a pretty cool ratio of potassium in line with that 10 to 1 CalMag ratio. So 600 parts per million or milligrams per kilogram of potassium. We've got a decent amount of phosphorus and we've got a very cool amount of zinc, a little bit of copper, um, and we've got sulfur too. So what this doesn't go into is obviously the minor nutrients like cobalt and um, and molybdenum but for the major cations this looks like a very good way to charge your biochar and make it look a lot like a developed natural soil or have a similar mineral profile to that so that that's that is the goop that was a that's the goop but the goop is basically just an old compost extract with lots of fungi lots of um microbes in it um so it's not going to be too different to an extract you make um mm -hmm albeit maybe just a little bit higher population of microbes. Once it's processed, that kind of that that um those nice ratios of minerals just kind of naturally happen. Um, 
And that's, well, that's if you make a decent mix, right? So our compost pile has about 60% carbon in it. It's got a lot of wood chip in it. And in that wood chip, it's got a lot of calcium. But that calcium is in the total nutrient pool. It takes a long time for that wood chip to break down and to release that calcium. And so this com this compost extract is basically just made up of compost that has thoroughly processed that wood chip and therefore everything else because you know the green material process is a lot faster um, and it's released its calcium and so you have a nice amount of calcium in a premature compost generally the green stuff decays first and it releases a lot of potassium so we'll see a potassium spike in the young compost while the calcium is still held in the wood chip the potassium floods out of the um, green material because it has a high affinity with water and I think as that potassium comes out, that's when some of your endophytes are coming out too. So one, one, one more. Okay. One more slide and then I'm done. Are we all good on time, Tom? I have a yeah, yeah, we're great. We're watching. Great. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. We've got far too many tabs open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zoom isn't used to this many tabs. <laughs> Do you, can I ask quickly what rain, what water you use for the goop? Do you, do you use rainwater? No, I'm... we just use municipal water. Everyone is totally scared about chlorine. They don't yeah. necessarily have to be that scared. I wouldn't say don't be worried. You should test, but as long as you test and it's consistently safe, then it's fine to use. Right. In fact, recently I just started working at a market garden. They were like, can you test our water? Cause we have a multi photometer in the lab. Can you tell us if it's safe to use to irrigate? Are we going to damage our micro? So I tested it and it was 0, 0.00. I was like, okay, no chlorine, right? <laughs> and then I tested it again, 0, 0.01. So very, very, very tiny amounts of chlorine, almost to the point where we need to maybe be worried <laughs> that wow. there's not enough chlorine <laughs> because, you know, and mm -hmm. recently reports of E. coli and salmonella poisoning in the Southwest from um, the water supplier. So, Water supplies are getting really lazy. Water's getting really dirty. Um, it might be getting to the point where we need to worry about um, the actual chlorine level, not because it's going to kill our microbes, but that it's not going to control microbes in the pipelines. Um, but usually it's around 0 0.02, 0 0.03, all of which are safe. If it was getting above 0 0.05, 0 0.06, if you ever saw one part per million, you should start to be worried. You know, that's going to kill microbes. If you're in two parts per million, now you're in a swimming pool, right? I seem to be detecting chlorine at about 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 parts per million. So if you can smell it, it's it's around it's it's around there, but that's still safe, right? So reach out to your water provider, get free chlorine tests, use them, or send us samples and we can test the chlorine for you if you if you're um, worried. If you're using rainwater, no need to worry. Tap water. I'd actually start to be, you know, if the, you test the chlorine, it's okay. Still test for bicarbonates because bicarbonates can be a real um, detrimental factor for microbes as well. If you're using well water, test for the bicarbonates because it, it's not just microbes, it's nutrition as well, mineral nutrition. It's going to bind every trace minerals. Yeah, it can do some damage to your, to your nutrition in the soil if it builds up over time, right? So just a pointer, but... I don't think you have to really be worried about chlorine. Obviously, in summer, they might use more. It depends who the technician is who pours the chlorine in at your local site, really. And so always test, but I wouldn't be overly worried about it in general. Okay, thank you. That's Are you cool. looking at what I'm looking at? It says wheat drought resilience test. Yeah. Yes. So again, what we did is put wheat. I love stressing wheat out, putting it in really stressful conditions and, you know, putting these micros with it and seeing what happens. So this was just a single treatment to seed and a single treatment to soil. And it's kind of a sloppy graph because it could, it should start at about 76%, but it starts at hundred percent. What that re represents is just, I saturated the soil, right? I got the soil saturated when the seed went in and then I measured so I knew the saturation point because I was using something called an aromatotensiometer. tensiometer. It's a little um, ceramic tip on a plastic tube that's filled with water. And then at the end of the tube, you have a pressure gauge. So as the water draws out the, sorry, as the ceramic tip dries out in soil, it draws out the water, it creates a little vacuum that pulls on a pressure gauge, it gives you ability to read out 
um, a, a soil moisture reading in kilopascals, right? So I found saturation point with that device, and then I calibrated a Blue Lab moisture meter at saturation. So Blue Lab moisture meter is a little probe, poke it into the soil, get reading to, to your phones. I did lots and lots of different readings per data point um, and then created an average with lots and lots and lots of different data points. So as so this represents a drought and um, we planted our seed and directly after we planted our seed, we imagined there's a drought. So for 10 days after we planted the seed, there was no moisture added to the containers and it was in the native, well, a, a sandy, um, a sandy like turf soil, let's put it like that. So as it dried out, the treated plants dried out slower. And as we got further into the drought, each to, each point in the graph represents a point where I um, took lots of measurements. The further we got into the drought, the bigger the difference between the treatment and the control. So with just one treatment to seed and one treatment to soil, we get drought buffering. So, you know, it, it's not hard to figure out the untreated control is going to reach a permanent wilt point before the treated plant. So when you're doing large scale agriculture, there's no irrigation around. This is kind of big news, right? That you can buffer those droughts with just a simple treatment of compost extract of the seed. And um, if you can get it into the soil, whether that would be some kind of furrow treatment or a ripper dripper kind of job. If you could do that, then you could get um some protection from drought amazing and that's called is that called that's bio priming with the goop that you've explained there so. yeah it's a, yeah a seed treatment or bio priming seeds yeah excellent amazing. and again 1.5 mil per square meter which is about 14 liters or 15 liters at, at, um per hectare wow that's very so small cool. amounts so small yeah wild thanks adam no worries so oh. I, could, I could bang on for a bit, but um, well, yeah. Does, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I'm sure there are like loads of questions. I'd actually like to suggest that what we could do is maybe have like a few minute comfort break, um, and just think, um, on that like break, of what kind, of, what what would you like to ask, um, these uh. Uh, the only word that's coming to my head is experts. I hate it. It's a bad word, but you are um, geeks. These, what would you like to ask these <laughs> these soil microbe and um, compost geeks about? Uh, you know, because it's not it's very rare we're in the same room and able to ask any question we want. But also, I would love to sort of steer this debate um, towards like local composting for uh, you know the soil repair and how can we make the best use of our resources locally where we all are um uh, to, to you know to, to 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 kind of bridge the gap between you know our, our our nutrients that we all have and are surrounded by and agriculture where there's this like complete wall separation and 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 obviously adam adams uh, and and um, work and some of our work with like local composting and supplying it to market gardens is 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 starting to bridge that gap but it's like ultimately my sort of philosophy is like if we can't uh if we're not gonna uh if the cities and places where people live aren't going to give back to the land that feeds them then it's it's a one way you know it's a kind of it's going to carry on hill whereas if we could meaningfully re repopulate the, the soils with life and nutrients like from these things we're currently burning as waste then that would be amazing and i know there's some amazing work being done in this uh group to sort of uh, at council levels to sort of really reassess and try and make a difference on this system so kind of if everyone would just take a few minutes to mull over like questions that they'd like to ask adam and the mats um and then we'll come back and hopefully have a really like a lively q a brilliant okay um who has got a question um or shall i um, I'd love to ask, can I ask, I'll ask, I'll ask a question. My, my question is about um, mycorrhizal fungi and biochar. Um, what has anyone done any, is that, is that a, a, a thing that you think would work like a story, like inoculating specifically mycorrhizal fungi? So not even the biology we're making with compost, but um, 
mycorrhizal fungi. Yeah. Is that necessary or is that is that a good idea or is that just not intuitive? What would you what would be your response? And I'll ask um, Adam first. OK, yeah, I would say that um, like vermiculite, it's a very, you know, as is before you load it up with nutrition. It's quite a nutrient deprived, but it's a very nutrient deprived environment. Right. So to ju to start growing mycorrhizal fungi, you need a host plant. And you need some reason for that host plant to make the connection. So that is basically a nutrient deprived environment. Um, so that's why you use vermiculite, I think, in the production of mycorrhizal fungi is because it's nutrient deprived. You put the plants in there, they need nutrients and they form relationships more readily because there's a demand for them to form a relationship. Um, I'm sure Matt can put me straight on that if I've gone wrong. <laughs> Would you like to respond to that, Matt? not sure which map but yeah. I, I i was just gonna say i don't really know um so i i will yeah t learning learning yeah, so we're really. culturing we're culturing mycorrhizal fungi and sorghum at the lab at the moment and we've started oh. stand to start them out in the nutrient deprived environment encourage them mm -hmm. to make those connections then we use the microscope to assess have they made a connection um, then we can go about manipulating them and transplanting the plants into some more permanent containers with a bit more nutrition available. I see. Yeah. So uh, biochar, that, uh, I is it, it must be nutrient poor. It is until you load it, right? Until it becomes the bio yeah. bit, until you mm -hmm. put nutrients and microbes in it. And then it's a nutrient poor environment. Matt Dunwell might be able to have, he might have more information on that. Yeah, I am. I'm. I'm aware, Adam, that you've got a lot more. Um, I think mo mostly what I'm going to say is like Adam says. Um, but <laughs> but I would also say um, uh, my approach is to try and get technology that's really accessible. So um, collecting a wide range of stuff is is where I think I'm coming from, and then letting that evolve into your situation. But I also really like, and you touched on it, Adam, I like the idea of training. Um, you can train your medium by by putting it next to stuff. So I, I would say there's maybe some experimenting to be done around seeing where those relationships are and and finding inoculant from there um, and 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 using uh, ferment to to actually reproduce that specific thing leading your micro microbiology in that direction um i also yeah I, and I, I also would really uh, uh, agree with adam in terms of longevity um and getting really mature products if you can to inoculate with thank We've you got a three-year-old um hyro restrepo native micro barrel outside there you are. I popped it open the other day and it was like the most beautiful fermented like soy kind of I don't know like the brand had broke down to some kind of beautiful fermenty smell so yeah 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 good stuff yeah, exactly mm. it's the like the bakashi of the gods for sure <laughs> <laughs> uh, Caroline you've you've got your hand up would you like to yeah I was just um uh, in our research that we did with Plymouth University researchers, it was amazing how quickly those hyphae networks actually set up in small pots, which we weren't expecting. And that was with biochar, but about 10, 20%, I think it was. But Adam and um, Daniel, we also used your goop. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember, I first took your goop and yeah, then yeah. we didn't get the funding. So I kind of just left it on the side. And then we did get the funding, but I thought, okay, better have some fresh goop. But the old goop, I just put into these buckets with, um, well, there was a whole mix. There's about 10 different mixes, but some was with um, compost, some was just with wood chippings. And they kind of just stayed there. And that's about a year and a half ago now. And um, in the nursery, they just used it. And then I had some in plastic bags. And it's not really had, it's not been looked after. It's not had any water but I've just recently moved it to the polytunnel. It's absolutely seething with life. It's absolutely amazing that nothing has been done with this stuff. <laughs> and it's full of things just coming out of it now. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Amazing. Amazing. Um, John, um, I'd like to just give you a quick um, introduction and uh, opportunity to, 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 to introduce yourself because uh, 
Yonu and to the network and um, have been very busy in Forest Row and to sort of get yeah, set up with the local composting uh, path for this debate. John, over to you. Mm. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be on my first call here. Um, and yeah, um, some of you might have seen the conversation that has been recently start going on in the WhatsApp group about um, what I'm looking at in Forest Row is how to, not only how to set up a local composting scheme that's modeled on other places like in Brighton, North Room or wherever else, um, but how do we change the way composting is done at the, at the council level? Um, because it seems, yeah, it seems like the way that it's done is, is, is kind of like not, not great <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah. So I guess I'm interested to find out what's already going on, but also I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm having a meeting tomorrow with the guys that look after waste disposal within Wielden. And obviously in, in the country, we have, we have district councils that look after waste, uh, collection, and then we have. The county councils that that look after the processing of that food waste and they have to work or work together so it's kind of like trying to think through like what is the hybrid model here of like community composting and then like the kind of scale the mm. scale of like doing you know hundreds of thousands of homes potentially is worth of food waste like how does how do, how do we kind of like create yeah what's being done at the moment and what what could we do and when we're as we're thinking about um, changing the model here mm, that's great and um, I'd, I'd just like to follow that up with a sort of uh, question of like you know these big um, municipal waste um, players um, you know what 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 would be the best thing that they could do with these contracts to handle such huge quantities of food waste in order to make the most valuable uh, biofertilizer that would you know not just reduce their labor costs but actually like create meaningful jobs getting the biology and the life back to the to the land that depends on it like what what would you know what, let's 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 let everyone answer that question just because it'd be fascinating to hear the different perspectives from you know the soil food web approach to the biofertilizer approach mm. can we go first sure go for it, adam i think that they're both the same approach and i think what we need to think about is this waste is input right it's nutritive input that needs to go somewhere the problem is logistics often on one side of the country you got all the animals on the other side of the country you got all the arable so we need to get the manure to the arable right how do we do that well theoretically you know it's hard to break it all down logistically but theoretically we need to put nutrients into microbial biomass the bulk of the nutrition or what the conventional farmers are using as nitrogen needs to go into bacterial biomass really it's the easiest thing to do that is the higher risk strep of biofertilizer right if we're putting stuff we're loading organic matter uh, into bacterial biomass and as we apply that we need to apply it with higher trophic levels preferably if they could be active when we apply them so they're munching away as we're applying them so they can cycle that bacterial biomass so whether the nitrogen is coming from synthetic nitrogen or it's coming from green waste sites or you know food waste wherever it's coming from we need to get it into bacterial biomass as like a biofertilizer and then i think that needs to be applied with something like a compost extract that's carrying all those high trophic level specifically what needs to happen is they need to make the piles smaller they need to make the piles not so hot and they need to get the plastic out before they shred it mm. that's it take the plastic out we shred it get the pile down in size get the temperature down if you can use lactobacillus ferments like the silage process to hold on to nutrition for as long as possible um, without it off gassing you know then we keep a lot more nutrition around and we stop stuff off gassing into the atmosphere. Brilliant. Thank you. Three really nice bullet points at the end there that are really, yeah, communicable. Thanks, Adam. Matt, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, put a little shout out for a guy called Jerry Gillespie. I don't know whether people have heard about him on the network, but he's an Australian guy who's done a lot of work with local authorities and bulk composting. So, it, and it really, 
uh, rides on the back of what Adam said. So he's using lactobacillus and making it into a, a sort of biofertilizer that's very heavy on lactobacillus and then composting anaerobically. So so he's creating more of a, um, a silage and and he's working out that that's that's locking in a lot more nitrogen. Uh, it, it composts at a, at a lower temperature and you can do it at scale. So that this and I'd really recommend having a look at some of his papers. If you just Google Jerry Gillespie, so it's G-E-R-R-Y and then G-E-I-L-L-E-S-P-I-E, -E, Jerry Gillespie. Thank you, Matt. Definitely check that out. Um, Matt T, did you did you have um, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, I think more opportunities to learn like this, uh, really accessible. Yeah, spaces and and ways to learn. Yeah, it's good. Like uh, the books that Nikki's written, uh, just just more opportunities for people. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, that's super important. I read recently a, a, a meme, and it said, you know, that um, you know, agriculture in the past uh, failed because it was so. Uh, it was. The problem with it was it's so labor intensive the problem with agriculture today is it's too chemical intensive the problem you know and the 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 solutions we're missing you know the is it basically the knowledge of of how to you know put the put the life back and uh that is why yeah these conversations are so important to yeah get, get, get figure out the best practice collectively because we're all operating in these lo lo small localities but we have access to the land around us and we we need a coherent sort of strategy to um yeah make the best of our of our resources like that's what it is isn't it? fundamentally um yeah sorry i've um, um I've, I've realized rachel's had a hand up for a while and uh, you haven't had a chance to say hello yet so rachel is um the uh, uh, one of the people behind carbon farmers um and um it's the awesome biochar um mobile biochar product which um, I'm really excited to start working with. So yeah, over to you, Rachel. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think my question sort of about more about kind of um, compost application, kind of biochar application when you actually put it into the soil. Um, so full disclosure, I mean, obviously carbon farmers, we make sort of biochar um, makers. I sort of always focus much more on the water filtration side of biochar's properties and not so much on kind of the composting side. So I'm sort of slightly new to this all as well. Um, learning obviously a lot, and this has been absolutely amazing so thank you so much one thing that's i've always wondered about so a lot of the, sort of the talk about biochar and obviously about kind of putting bacteria and everything is always going we've got to put it back into the soil is it the sort of thing where over time i mean once you've got kind of your microbes and your bacteria and all your fungi and everything really good and healthy in your soil you need to put less over time or is it kind of like chemical fertilizers where you just have to keep applying year on year because your plant will just use up whatever's there or is it sort of once it's there you made up all the soil happy again and then you sort of put less and less over time mm -hmm. or do we not really know <laughs> yeah i can go or someone yeah, else can go first this time no problem adam no i think um okay. direct... yeah or, unless matt wanted matt, to are you ready you go first this time yeah right. yeah uh, I've been really nervous again before Adam, but I'll give it a go. Uh, so uh, um, I, from what I understand, what biochar does is it increases the functionality of soil. So the, it's a bit like a flywheel. I would say, yes, you put it in and the overall effect is that it makes soil more functional. Um, and I, and I, so that's the main answer to your question. I think then also there's always this thing with soils about how you manage them. So you can take a soil and put biochar in that's really great and it'll function really well. And you can do some poor management on that soil and you might, might want to actually then re-inoculate it. Um, uh, I, I have seen in some biochar texts that you need to re-inoculate your soil with biochar, with biology in it every sort of five to seven years. And I'm, I, I, I'd be really interested in Adam's thoughts on that. But for me, I think it's it's... There is a one-off really good effect and then it's about management and how you treat that soil post that but um, i'm sure putting more carbon in more biochar wouldn't wouldn't hurt okay great brilliant response 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's it. So, yes, there is a continuum to soil health, right? And that's what regenerative agriculture should be about, you know. Um, it should be understanding that continuum. So where are you on that scale as you come into the situation? And the only way to really do that is testing. I'm just like Hiro. I love the testing, right? Because as soon as you do the testing, you know, where are we on the scale from a knackered conventional old farm that's been going 70 years doing the triple superphosphate and the you know the glyphosate and the, the massive oxidative stress mm. and you know gabe brown's 600 parts per million respiration lovely soil where crop residue disappears within a year or well well under a year right so that that's a, a test within itself how fast does the crop residue disappear if we're talking about large scale arable farms how or, or any farm you know that you leave residue on the ground how fast is it disappearing now how mm. fast is that soil consuming the organic matter mm. and yes that... it's it there's different needs for different soils so depending on where you are on in that continuum you're going to need different actions so to begin with yeah you need to load loads of carbon in um mm. if you're a conventional farm you might have to wean yourself off um the synthetic nutrients you know like the ammonium nitrate the urea definitely don't cut them out to begin with don't try and switch from full-blown conventional to full-blown alaining them you know in one season because it's not really you know it's going to be highly variable the results and we would like you to not we would like you to have good results right mm -hmm. so you give biological agriculture a good name and so mm -hmm. that requires a slow transition generally depending on the condition so i would say testing is really cool you need to know where you are to know where you're going to be in the future right and and to know how you're going to get there some really cool tools for that are microscopy look at your soil it's a bit limited for scale because soils are really lacking we're a long way away from changing the microscopy numbers in large scale soils the haney test is really good that was a, a soil test devised by a guy called rick haney who's still alive which is rare for a man who designed a soil test um so that looks that really dives into the health of the soil it gives you a respiration uh, metric which is um how much is the soil respiring you know um these are aerobic organisms or fermentative organisms that breathe um breathe out co2 so how much is the the soil respiring and then what are the kind of resources in the soil it looks at water extractable organic carbon and water extractable organic nitrogen traditionally we've looked at ionic forms of nitrogen right just ammonium and nitrate and usually you get a soil test it looks low and the, the agronomist goes it's low put on nitrogen right but what we're missing is all this all these organic compounds and the nitrogen they contain you know the bacterial biomass how much nitrogen does it contain that is a blind spot on a traditional test so we don't see that um, water extractable organic nitrogen carbon on a traditional test if your soil is functioning and organic matter is being decomposed in a healthy way um you know you're creating um mm. you're creating humus and so we it's good to know that that system's in operation if you're applying lots of synthetic nutrients or you're plowing you're applying lots of oxidative stress on the soil glyphosate oxidative stress it's burning up carbon um it's killing or exciting microbes it's changing subtle interactions between plants and microbes mm -hmm. so yeah we need to know where we are to to know where we're going to go oh, uh, please do a, a workshop on the rick haney soil test <laughs> so people can uh, establish that but I'm, I'm really yeah really value that adam and uh I'm, thank you for reminding us that the purpose is to like to to build a to, to build kind of a, the appetite of our soils you know I, and Matt, I, I'm, I, I remember on the high row course he was telling us about the the fields he manages with just like one um shepherd animal and uh, large flocks of um large herds of of, of cattle and um you know the, the cow pats they only last like I swear he said like a couple of days before they're completely back, yeah, back, shredded back. and spread and that, yeah. is what, that is the goal is to have just like soils that can absorb all of our like what we're commonly calling waste into their into root plant root depth and you know the power of the soil to sort of access the minerals and put them up into life again right and yeah thanks for sharing sharing that also yeah it's the respiratory uh, function of the soil that's important and 
Brilliant. Um, okay, we've got a, a hand up from, we've had John's hand up for a while and Diana. Um, Diana, would you like to um, ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just thinking about what John had said and about dealing with councils and trying to be like a mediator, trying to find some way of communicating all of this amazing kind of geeky science, wonderful stuff that we're all talking about with council people who don't have a clue and not agriculturalists uh, in a different world to us. And you start talking about this stuff and they just straight over their heads. They're not interested. It doesn't fit with their stuff. And trying to think about how to use some of the language that we've talked about this evening to tell a compelling story and just thinking really about what do you think the two maps and Adam is, are the key things that you would communicate to someone in a council who's making decisions about this sort of stuff and also what would you say to a small community composting scheme is the easy first step they can do to try and improve their compost to make it more biologically rich other you know if you're small scanning you don't know what you're doing great questions thank you diana um great um could i ask uh, matt to speak first on that oh i mean matt Dun matt dunwell would you matt do you do you want to go because i've been doing a lot of matting <laughs> it's uh on the spot it, it's tricky to uh come up with 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 that but i suppose just the key message is, from my perspective, is soils are alive and we need to start treating them that way. That goes for compost as well. So let's start a conversation about how we can bring soils back to life. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. So um, it's, a, it's a really good question and, and uh, we've all been there talking to people who are who, who who are not in this world uh i would say it's really interesting to, to try and look at the point of intervention so like if you can start dialogues with say schools or hospitals you're taking a step back from from the large-scale local authority waste stuff and i think there are so looking at where you engage is important and i think you might find individuals in those um institutions that are producing a large amount of green waste who who may have more open mind um i think there's lots of potentials for working with lactobacillus and and schools for instance um where where they're not having to sort stuff it's just if it's organic it goes in a slot bucket bang you know um and I, so so and lactobacillus in general i think is 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 really worth looking at so then the other three tools i would say is to look at finance and, and trying to work out where there's value in the stuff that we're talking about and and locating that for the for the local authority to talk about health like when, when you know when i was talking about slow, treating slurry with with lactobacillus it it works in terms of lowering the nitrites going into groundwater which directly affects stomach cancer for instance so you know there's there's a ways of intervention that are really key to environmental health officers and then there's the whole climate argument so there's a lot of councils have got climate departments now where you can really nail a lot of stuff onto climate on the climate department councils epic perfect thanks matt um i'd just like to put uh, daniel uh, in the spot here so daniel um and adam our soil ecology lab daniel has offered a comment about scale go for it daniel hi guys um i'm very lucky to um be working on a daily basis with that genius of a man mr adam swan over there mm -hmm. i love it very much um i've had many conversations with the industry the fact that we're actually located where we're located is because of my contacts with the industry since back in 2018 um and I, the, the insight that i just want to share with you is if you want to start any conversation you just need to maybe have that understanding of how they operate first and whether they're open for that conversation in the first place um and maybe you know if you have that that knowledge then then that can shape your strategy in the future so i, I don't want to tell you what to do i just want to tell you what the reality is right now um, the, the reason the industry exists in the first place, and by the industry, I, I mean green waste processing, is because 
the European Union decided we need to do something with landfill waste. Landfills are getting filled up. Let's see what we can do with material that goes in. And green waste is one category of, of that uh, landfill. Green waste and then food waste, those are two separate categories. I don't want to get into the detail right now. But basically they said, okay, well, let's incentivize people to divert stuff from the, from the landfills. And they did it by implementing a huge tax. So if you want to go to a landfill uh, place with your, with your waste, if you're a council, you pay maybe 20 to 30 quid per ton, but the actual tax is over 80. So you're paying five times more than, than you would normally because they put this massive levy on, on, on landfill. And so that created an incentive to then put investment into place to, um, to, to put these green waste operating sites in. But that doesn't mean that they're there to produce good material. They're there to receive green waste. That is their job. Their job is to receive green waste. And then basically, well, what do we do with that green waste, right? Well, you know, we have to process it somehow and then get rid of it somehow. And so then the industry, along with the environmental agency, created a standard called PASS 100. And PASS 100 standard basically means uh, process it in a way that makes the resulting material safe to handle with hands and so that people suddenly don't get sick because you used waste. So waste, all waste must be bad, right? So people then basically just adhere to that PASS 100 and then they're faced with another problem. Well, what do we do with that stuff now that we've created? It's, it's not necessarily a good product for anybody. So literally the industry talks about the land bank. And this is basically farmers who are willing to take their product and spread it on their land. And so that material doesn't necessarily have any value in, in any particular way. It doesn't have biological value, doesn't really have much in terms of um, value as, as a mineral addition. It creates a bit of organic matter that, that they can add and they can burn off with the nitrogen fertilizer that they, that they apply. So if you want to start that conversation, I think what you need to keep in mind that they are operating like a landfill. And at the moment, they're making a ton of money just by the fact that people drop off material. And I just thought this is important for this conversation if you ever wanted to go to that level. Thank you. Yeah, that was really important. Thank you. Um, thank you for that insight, Daniel. Yeah, definitely what I've experienced uh, it here. There's so much garden waste being turned into like this stuff that literally, you know, you buy five tons and you get given like 10 because they just want to empty the truck and they deliver it. Um, John, um, you've had your hand up for the longest and then and then we'll go Nikki. Oh, no, sorry. Um, unless um, one, uh, did you want to respond, Matt Dunwell, to that original question? No, you're happy to pass. Okay. Oh, hmm. John, um, back to you, mate. Yeah, thank you, Daniel, for that. I guess my question kind of adds on to that, which is, and 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 um, the person that spoke behind before me, Diana, like getting this into the language that councils understand is is really key. Um, and what the councils are worried about is their finances, uh, as as and other things. But like, so Daniel just made the point that the that the current arrangement is is kind of is currently the most financially attractive option. Um, and I guess what the question that we're not going to solve here on this call, but like, like I'm the question I'm wondering about is how how do we go to the council and say that they they are going to get the climate benefits, the community benefits? I think the health benefits point that um, uh, someone mentioned, Matt, I think, um, was really was good was was really good. But yeah, the you know what is what is the financial? You know, how do we? You know, I'm, I've got a meeting with our district council tomorrow, the waste team. And I'm like, what, what do I say to them? Or what could I say to just give them the sense that actually there's, there's also financial benefits, like mm. that you don't have to contract out like what you're doing to some, someone else and actually lose like potential revenue. You could bring it in house and you can, you can make money as well as having all of these other um, benefits around that. Has anyone got any thoughts? And I know that we're getting towards the end of the call. It's so, the old book, Bucky Fuller thing of you have to render the existing system obsolete and you basically have to take them to the pile of cash and be like, look, 
there's the pile of cash. This is the new value that renders this old system obsolete. That's what it's going to take, you know? Yeah. That is what it's going to take. The money is what it's going to take. You need to make money for these people that's more or on top of what they're already making. So, like, so like, is our money enough? Like, we're like, uh, there's a lot of community compost organ organizations in this network, and we've been popping up market stalls and uh, selling compost for like around a pound a liter to local gardeners and uh, even like market gardeners. And is that enough? Is that just not enough uh, value for them? Because I mean, they're dealing with like thousands, hundreds, thousands of tons, and if they yeah. could get a pound a liter for it, or even fifty p a liter for it, then They've just got to wait a year until they've got a stock, you know. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. The, the kind of compost we create, you know, catalyst bio amendments create in two months. We've created oh. it in as in as fast as it doesn't look like a growing medium at that point, right? At that point, it doesn't look like a growing medium, but it's a microbial inoculant at that point. Then as it ages, it becomes more like a growing medium, it becomes more like soil, right? So that year point, you get a very nice soily compost that you can sieve it, use it as a growing medium. You know, it's also an inoculant at that point. Um, but earlier on, it's just an inoculant, right? And I think this is what we're going to have to make people recognize that that's, that's valuable. Wow. And that it needs to be, we need to manipulate the system, you know, make the piles smaller, make them cooler. And, and all the things I said before, get the plastic out of them before you shred them to make a nice product that's usable at scale, you know, and does something. Mm. That's the point. It has to do something. It has to help people out. It has to make soils more resilient, get people yields. So we kind of, to that to happen, need the farmers to be demanding. Like they need there to be. There needs to be a demand. Yeah, exactly. Like... And like, that's why Daniel Turgill started this thing is because, you know, for the, for Hyundai and BMW and Porsche and Jaguar to all be making electric cars, there had to be a company to come along and make an electric car popular. Mm. You know, and that was kind of Tesla. So we need to make the electric car popular. We need to make the biological compost Tesla and all compost. the bio fertilizers. You yeah. know, we need to make them popular and we need to show that they're useful and we need to show that they can be used at scale. 100%. Thank you. Yeah, that's. That's super clear. Um, wow, that's such a good question. We could just, could we just talk about this for the rest of the thing because that's so important, isn't it? That will change their their heads, and you don't, I don't, you know, you don't want to just start talking about all these like things you're really passionate about, and um, you know, the microorganisms. If that's not, they don't get it. Like they don't, they, they, you know, they're they're doing that because it's their business and their livelihood and their you know, we need to feed their family, and we need to show that this 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 is a better way to feed the family that allows future families to exist as well the yeah. thing is the peat ban right the fact that they're phasing out peat we need to make a we need to make growing media that work at the moment the peat free growing media are not very good it's just about you know the they take on the organic matter they decrease it in biomass they pump it out they call it peat free growing media and it doesn't work people buy it so they put a plant into it it fails and they think they can't grow plants but it's because right. the, the growing media I doesn't work that is, um, I'm just going to, uh, I just need to respond to that. So Adam, in your op opinion, uh, is, is it, are there two, are there two like cash crops from local composting in terms of, is there like the, the short term, you said catalyst by amendments are making biologically complete compost in two months. Is yeah. there that, that, that level of compost, which can be turned over quicker, done on an agricultural scale, um, and, and produce value or uh, as well as the the set this product too which is the the growing medium and yeah. like and it happens in way. theories yeah okay. in our model you skim off the microbes into the goop you sell that as the compost ages it becomes a better growing medium okay yeah so cool. it does both in one basically and i think that is what we're going to need to do we're going to need to make them realize the microbes are worth something and then we, we need to make them realize that if they have a place space infrastructure to mature it for longer then we can make better growing mediums, or at least that can be part of a growing medium, you know, with 5% biochar, with an aggregate, you know, it can become a good growing medium for horticulture. Excellent. Thank you. That's really cool. So there's kind of like an agricultural product and a horticultural product that could be uh, 
it's done. Yeah, bro. Um, Nikki, uh, you've had your hand up for a while, and uh, yeah, good to have you here. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted. I mean, it's really been great call, but what what everyone on this call is really focused on, quite rightly, is uh, is all the stuff we've been talking about. What local authorities talk about, and I've had a long experience with working with local authorities. Uh, they're not on this page at all, really. Um, I mean, they 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 went for collecting um, what they call green waste, which I call wasted resources, um, because of the landfill directive and all that stuff, because it was added on to 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 ways that they could make money from diversion um, to make compost from from landfill. So they they were on that kind of economic um route if you like but they're not businesses and they don't have business heads on them local authorities um but now as matt says matt said uh, you know the two good things that well Luke said lots of good things about but two of the things that really struck me were a was that they think in in terms of money and b they think into and now with the carbon um carbon credits and uh, carbon reduction so it depends where you live in the country as well. I mean, I live on Dartmoor and they come here um, and collect garden bags of garden material, which I quite a lot of it my, from my local neighbours. I pick it up myself and, and scurry back to my allotment with it. But they pick it up and then they have to truck it miles over, over the moors to the other side of Tavistock, which is like a, a big, it's right across Dartmoor from where I live to to take it to somewhere to process so the carbon miles are enormous doesn't stack up at all in uh, an, another local authority team bridge they 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 collected food waste and garden waste at the same time and uh, you know that most of that material and then it had to go through animal byproducts so they had to treat all of it even though 80 percent of it was garden waste they had to treat all of it as if it was food waste and came under all, all the all those uh, re regulations getting to 60 degrees C twice turning it three days at 60 and then again and a lot of it was rejected and had to go into landfill or landfill cover after that so you know there's so much and then they were learning all the stuff you've been talking about about the biology and blah blah, blah. they weren't getting it right for years because people didn't understand compost they didn't understand soils they know they don't know where it's going it's contaminated with plastic uh, and on and on. So the whole system is quite muddled. I mean, I we've got a green councillor now in Totnes, and she uh, in South Hams. This is district South Devon, and she's they they removed the uh, food waste. Uh, sorry, the uh, garden waste collection, and the money that they've saved on not collecting it. Um, they would have just gone sucked back into the council coppers, so to speak. She stood up and said, we should put this money that we're saving, £200,000, that was, we should put this money into promoting home composting, community composting, and food waste, small food waste uh, systems, um, and teaching people um, and converting uh, the, the wheelie bins that weren't being used into wormeries and so on. So that's the pro one of the projects I'm working on right at the moment. We've just done a two-day compost masterclass uh, for people, which was very successful. And we're doing a road show and, and so on. So councils can change, um, you know, if they've got the political will and you get a couple of people in there who know what they're doing. And one person or a few people in the council can change minds. So... I would say cultivate your local councillors, talk to them about all this stuff we've been talking about and, and you know, change hearts and minds. Get your, get your count, the local councillors, the what the reps on your district council and so on and, and work on it. I, I had lunch with a strategic development person for Devon County Council last week um, because she wanted my advice on her garden. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I could talk to her about that sort of thing, but then we've been colleagues for a while. So right. that it's, 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 you know, things are changing. And as Adam said, you've got that, that mindset. Um, you, you can't just follow the same mindset. You have to come with a different mindset and, and everyone on this call has got the right mindset, I would say. Um, mm. 
but we can influence them and we can change them you know realistically i feel like it has to be a separate company on the same greenway site that takes the best stuff that they get in and diverts it to a high quality compost it takes mm. longer to create but it's higher value meanwhile their whole get rid of the biomass thing is still you know it's still trudging along it's still doing its thing yeah. Yeah. But that's the only way you're going to show them that there's another way is simply by moving onto their site and doing it and being like, look, this is it. And it, now I'm getting this value for it. Can we just not rethink the whole system? Trouble yeah. is that the creation of this good compost takes time and space and their system is just about reduction in biomass. Yeah, and speed. Yeah. I know that True and True and Restoric is um, doing work up in the Northeast, you know, with, with his projects. But he he I was on a call with him the other day and he said the biggest problem biggest challenge they have is plastic contamination mm -hmm. and what and microplastics. That must be the biggest thing, the most expensive thing for them to filter. Uh, I, I guess, but I mean, just what you were saying there, um, it made me think. Yeah, it's gonna it's uh, so much boils down to the price of space, doesn't it? Like the price mm -hmm. of land and rent and what yeah. the fundamental costs because we have a high relatively high we're expansive you know composting properly is quite expansive and um mm -hmm. and that's not even fitting i know on this development i'm on now in lewis they've just got the planning permission to do a whole new green development tons of new homes and you know the the i they don't think the compost club model of having like a whole yard is gonna it's not gonna pay that it's not gonna be valuable enough uh use of this space it's all it's still spoken for it has to they have to get a certain number of homes and food and lands foodscapes and stuff in here and i you know we need a fields to do composting don't we um but yeah i love that idea adam thank you for uh sharing this go and speak to these uh municipal waste dealers and, and identify if there's land nearby and and yeah. see if they're up for um you know being collaborating on um you know, out, you know, gaming, gaming it a bit. Like, uh, we, 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 we want to make compost too, and we think we can make it better than you. Would, would you let, let us give give it a try, kind of thing? Um, yeah. Can I, can I ask a quick question, question to to Matt? A Matt to Matt question. Um, so Matt, you're doing some research into into plastics uh, and microplastics. Is do you yeah. is it realistic to think that we can deal with microplastics in green waste through microbial action or is that is that like a pipe dream um, may well i don't know i still don't know uh yeah like daniel says it's much better just to remove remove it and like adam's been saying just just sort it out beforehand uh pet bottles every bottle they still take five, 10 years in uh, environmental conditions is my understanding of how long it takes. Hard plastics take a lot, lot, lot longer. Uh, but then there's all the plasticizers inside them. Uh, uh, so it seems like, yeah, Daniel has, has <laughs> some, some advice on this, but uh, there was a study recently of um, soils at uh, Rothamsted, and a hundred years ago there was no microplastics, and it's gone up about ten times in whatever soil you look at, organic or not, uh, in the past fifty years. Uh, so it breaks down slowly. They're introducing other kinds of plastic, but yeah just to remove it before you compost it that's that's the main thing and i suppose you can incentivize that by saying okay there's no plastic no plasticizers in there uh and so that's that's not going to transfer but we've had like 30 tons of green waste to the farming with fungi site and as many of you have seen it's just peppered with it mm. uh the enzymes will gradually evolve on what time scale i don't know to metabolize all these different plastic substrates uh like fungi uh found out this way of breaking down lignin um before that trees i'm talking about like tens of millions of years ago 
Um, so presumably the same will happen with plastic, but uh, how long it will take, I don't know. The way that people recycle plastic with biology at scale is by isolating the enzyme. Uh, the trouble with plastics is that they're so crystalline, it's hard to break down. Uh, my phone battery is about to die, uh, so I, I might disappear. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. That was a great answer. Thank you. Oh, wow. There's uh, tragically only 10 minutes left of this call. Um, I I just want to say that if, if I want to encourage anyone that wants to talk about this more to just um, like get in touch. If you've got a talk you want to do or an event or a, th a thing you want to share and then just contact me and I will like you know make a flyer and 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 get, get the get the compost geeks together because I, I i sort of think this is so you know critical now we've all these different problems in our different contexts and need to keep this conversation going um because it's incredibly urgent um and you know can change the whole course of sort of human culture and civilization mm -hmm. so, um yeah anyone um that hasn't asked a question yet would like to say anything ah amanda Thanks. Um, this is slightly at a tangent, but I live on the coast and I've got into this issue because I'm collecting unwanted seaweed and I'm composting that. Does anybody have any experience of composting seaweed, please? I've put seaweed in compost piles, not in any massive amount. Um, so, no, it was just kind of a trace input rather than, a, you know, a, a macro input. Yeah, what sort of quantities are you talking about? Um, good question. Um, <laughs> I've probably got about eight big piles that are each sort of a meter high and three meters by three meters, so quite a bit. Quite a bit. Well, I would say the first thing is that, uh, uh, as I always say to everyone, you've got to think about air and water with compost and seaweed is going to be very wet and dense and you get extremely smelly quite quickly unless you can get air through it so you need something to aerate it like i mean i i, I get masses of thatching straw which i find is fantastic but whatever you can get to get air through it uh it will compost far better yeah Thank you could you. also do the silage thing try and yeah, it in the silage yeah. Or and, then cash, or it, yeah. and then mix it with 60 percent wood chip all what right. i would also think yeah. about is maybe give it a little wash if you can if it's possible just because it's probably really high in sodium and chloride maybe a bit too high for if you're going to use it for mm. well if you're going to use it at scale and spread it out it for a large area it, it probably it, it, doesn't matter but if it's sort of small... it, oh sorry adam to interrupt I was just going to say, it really depends where you've got it from. If you've got it from yeah. the beach and it's had a lot of salt spray on it, it's going to be salty. If you mm. if it's been harvested, uh, that's another matter. But uh, yeah, uh, but yeah. there are there are licensing things on harvesting seaweed, obviously. Can I ask one um, question quickly on that um, topic? Uh, is it not the case that the soil? Uh, wants to eat the seaweed as it is and that the farmers may be more easily persuaded to like they used to just put seaweed on as a mulch uh to to, to is that is composting in the soil not the path of least resistance in that yeah. case lazy yeah. beds in ireland and scotland that's what they did grow potatoes on, on rock <laughs> and if that was the case would there be something would you recommend like bokashiing the compost um potentially uh, yeah, that's going to speed up the incorporation for sure. So turn it into biology as well, and then make that a more yeah. value. Or grinding yeah, it, a... you know, grinding it into a meal. Mm. Mm. There's, right, there's, there's a, a a group that I'm. I did a session with in Pembrokeshire, and I, they operate out of Milford Haven, I think, and I can't remember their name. Is it they, Carrymore? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And they they've started using lactobacillus with seaweed, and they and it, they create this beautiful amber uh, seaweed extract that is a uh, lactobacillus ferment and um, so oh. so you can go the sort of anaerobic route with it as well which would be really worth experimenting with a, you need a blue barrel and oh. a, a cup of rice thank you <laughs> thank you very much thank yeah you like daniel said in the comments there's a big push for seaweed seaweed's really popular at the moment mm. and there's lots of companies popping up harvesting it and making yeah. um make it by stimulants the one thing is it could be quite expensive at scale you know so uh, but yeah. yeah it's a it's a high value product if you can make a cold pressed seaweed extract or something like that. 
Well, Carolyn, we had uh, uh, what's he called? Rob from uh, doing fermented seaweed. Yeah, uh, Matt. Matt, he's called. He's got oh, fermented Matt. seaweed in Devon, oh. a small company. Yeah, which was great. Which is great. Um, I used I used some. I mean, it looked great. It turned yeah. my broad beans from very yellowy to green pretty much overnight. Yeah, I'm doing lots of tests with it at the moment, actually. But it's uh, the smell disappears immediately with biochar. If you yeah. add a little bit of biochar, there's no smell at all. Because <laughs> yeah. I've been taking little jam jars to, you know, the different village yeah. fates I'm doing. And I say, okay, smell that. And then there's another one with a little bit of biochar in just like 24 hours. It just removes the smell immediately. All oh, so, right. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. So if you don't want something smelly, add a bit of biochar what's in. His, what's his company? Atlantic. Atlantic. Uh, Atlantic. Yeah. Atlantic Atl seaweed, isn't it? It's Atlantic. I think Atlantic something. But yeah, he's a very interesting guy. Yeah, oh, they've got the first. Uh, they've got uh, two farms in uh, Foy and uh, off Plymouth, I think. Yeah, uh, and it's river. out at sea, isn't it? Rather than it's out on at the coast. sea, yeah. So, so they're not... growing. They're growing it on ropes. Yeah. Oh, right. um, okay. Feels like you know, yes. Feels like there needs to be a sort of foraging movement for, like, in partnership with farmers to forage some of this, you know, nutrients because the tendency is for them to make into something dried, like a pellet or something a machinery can obviously apply, but also, we just need people getting it back to the land. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, that's another um, discussion. Yeah, for sure. Some seaweeds are high-end gourmet products. You know, don't need to do anything but eat it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. No you probably have to watch what you're doing with it because of the high pollution in the seas at the moment. Because I know yeah. Rob from Exeter Charcoal made sar um, took sargassum and made um, biochar out of that last year. And it was really, really high in heavy metals. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what happens to those in the soil, whether they get broken down quickly or not, but I think it's something Plants to keep in mind. Broken down, no. They just get they can only get wrapped up in the carbon matrix of the soil, but they're not really going to go anywhere if you put them down. No. Would it be better to hot compost them than if it had heavy metals? No, it's just try and not put it around where you're going to grow food. Food, yeah. Yeah. So get. So can anyone recommend like the easiest or the quickest test to do on a matter like that that we might have as? Yeah, I mean it's in your past one hundred thing. NRM will do it. NRM, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank oh, you. Good questions. Really good questions. Yeah. Anyone um, else with a burning question? Um, I've, I'm aware we've just skimmed a lot of these answers but you know that's just always going to be the way on the zoom call um but yeah um okay two minutes i'm just going to um yeah i wanted to um ask everyone what, what would what would you like um the next session to be um uh what do you think after this and the last ones and the biochar ones we did at the beginning of the year like maybe there's two you know groups that want to emerge like the biochar the people that want to talk about making products with biochar and the people that just want to focus on local composting solutions and getting that cycle um, moving. I, I just, I guess that's also a huge question that we can't answer in a couple of uh -huh. minutes, but uh, maybe just to put that out there and then invite you to contact, um, to, to contact me if basically I'm, I'm sort of looking for, um, I realized that the forum and this whole knowledge ecosystem, which we have, uh, it's only going to work if we have sort of groups that are focusing on the different areas they can they can the spaces will really work you know otherwise like the biochar space is starting to work i would say because you can go in there and ask a question and the great biochar wisdom keepers will give you the answer i tested it recently it really worked <laughs> um and uh you know I made loves made some screen and i learned how to screen biochar because it and that's the kind of value i feel of um building these little knowledge um, hubs and ecosystem through these conversations. So yeah, I guess, you know, it's already kind of there, you know, we've got Martin, who's the Bakashi and expert, and so many different experts we can put in uh, to make these spaces work. But um, I guess, yeah, I want to, I want to do more of these conversations, um, but I kind of would like them to be uh, mycelium led. <laughs> that's, uh, that's all I had to say. Mm -hmm. so um yeah unless anyone has another question i'm just going to say thank you for a really um inspiring um and informative session um adam daniel matt matt um thank you um uh, 
everyone that was super cool and um yeah this is one that i kind of yeah feel i, I need to watch back uh again it's like that's just like a lot of this it's like wow you realize how little you know and how important it all is um thank but, you very much for facilitating it and, and posting it tom thank you very awesome. much for that yeah, I just want to say that, Tom, as well. I, this is my first time I've been there. I feel like I've crashed an amazing party. And um, <laughs> and I, I really, really appreciate the, the platform. And also, you know, the, it's brilliant to come together with people who are so on it. Uh, it's really a fantastic service that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was, that's really great. I love doing it, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, everyone. Well, yeah, until next time, I'll um, yeah, keep be in touch. <laughs> <laughs>